Hello, this is Matt O'Leary and still listening to music out here. 2022 was a year and uh, like all years, there was music in the year. So this one is going to cover said music. I went back and forth about this, but I decided on a top 20 albums of the year for 2022. So that's what I'm going to cover today. A lot of variety here. We bounce back and forth from indie rock to pop to prog to jazz to... Uh, everything in between, really. Without further ado, let's do it. Let's get to number 20 on the list. Made the cut. It's Secret Gardens with Everbloom. This is some instrumental rock, a melodic prog in the vein of like Covet or Pliny, you know, very guitar centric. Everbloom's the second album from this guy. The first was Tundra from 2021, which was a winter themed album and understandably kind of a more austere post rock sound. This one's a lot more playful, a lot more mathy in spots and uh, you know, still really chill and smooth, but nothing too angular or difficult. Overall, this is very well written. There are mid-song tectonic shifts in the structure to, to keep things interesting. And uh, the first song in the album really does not represent the whole thing. So you have to get past that one to really know what's going on. My favorite is the electronic sprinkled Idaho willow with a thick bass groove that just won't quit. You even got a, a super dynamic vocal guest appearance from the singer of the band Idola with some unexpected screams, but uh, very welcome, very cool. It also sounds like someone really excited to experiment and make music and that optimism and vibrancy really permeates the whole record. Got to shout out a, a pretty strange one at number 19. This is the Aristocrats with Primus Chamber Orchestra out of Poland. This is actually a, a remix album. It's previous Aristocrat songs with orchestral arrangements thrown on top. Yeah, it's weird. It's, it's already a very dense sound when you think of uh, what the aristocrats do. You know, it's prog metal, it's jazz fusion, it's very technical, it's very intricate. So to have an orchestra on top of that, and against all odds, this really works. And the reason I think is because the orchestra is put in after the fact, and it's done so very tastefully. You know, it's not dominating the sound, it's just punctuating the right moments and accompanying and complementing what's already there. This is nuts, this is crazy, this is off the walls and ridiculous, but this is completely awesome. Like, escape, put on the headphones, it's very long, just whew. The aristocrats are three absolute titans of their instruments, like there's no one better. It's Guthrie Govan on guitar and Marco Miniman on drums and Brian Beller on bass. And they're not just technically amazing either, you know, they know when to go hard, but they also know when to when to back off and give each other space. They just have this impeccable chemistry and really an awe-inspiring gift. This next one was truly unexpected. It's a Midwest emo and post-hardcore inspired band on the fabled Christian rock label Tooth & Nail Records. Home of these early aughts bands like Under Oath and Amberlin, you know, it really was the, the outlet of all angst amongst millennial youth group kids. The lyrics uh, explore past hurts, they explore present doubts, and they really just seem obsessed with this kind of psychology trend of trauma. You know, you, you could say it's kind of a exhibitionistic sort of self-therapy. And the music is great. Heal My Head is a, a real highlight for me. It, it's in 7-4 and it really sticks in my mind. And then there's that great climax at the end where they stop and then hit it. So good. Singer Kevin Klein kind of sings with a hushed tone on the first couple choruses, but then on the last one, he just yelps it out, kind of like the way uh, Reliant K would do it, you know, Matt Thiessen. And it's just a really great effect. That massive ending on the song The Days is another huge highlight. I really enjoy this, and like I said, it just came out of nowhere. Inside Out Records is probably the biggest prog label going at the moment. And this next band at number 17 is one I just got into this year. I know they have a really deep and rich back catalog, which I'm excited to get to, but this one caught my attention, and it's The Tangent with Songs from the Hard Shoulder. Band leader Andy Tillerson kind of has this favorite uncle sort of vibe about his vocals. You know, he's kind of just a, a storyteller. He's a raconteur. He's a guy at the bar who could have this large crowd gathered around him and, you know, turn these mundane little anecdotes into these grand tales. 
This is very heady symphonic prog with little touches of that very whimsical Canterbury sound, especially on the instrumental track GPS Vultures, which is definitely my favorite from the album. I love the Latin feel. I love that it kind of brings to mind this Miles Davis bitches brew sort of thing. With three epic tracks over 10 minutes and very warm, optimistic melodies and complex arrangements, this one just, it just hits all the right buttons of that classic sound, that Yes era sound. Number 16 is a, a very welcomed and surprising return from an indie rock band. After 11 years, the last album was called It Calls You from 2011. And my wife and I listened to this a ton in the car. It was really a, a bop for us at that time. So uh, this is a, a, a great return from the MV core. It's called Born in Fog. Born in Fog just has a ton of variety for an album in this style. You know, it's kind of a, a blend of Radiohead and Vampire Weekend and, and um, Mute Path and Spoon, you know, all those kind of rolled together and definitely a little Tom York with the vocal, especially on a song like It's Not Enough to Try with these big falsetto payoffs. The song Bandelay is a production highlight with its big dramatic synth arpeggios and hip hop drums. Then there's Weather Baby, which has a Motown bass line and pulls these string samples. I just love the, the different moods on this album. Every single song seems to bring something new. There are some elements that stay consistent, like the vocals, but otherwise it's a bit of a sample platter. And, you know, as much of an album guy as I am with progressive rock, you know, wanting that full album experience, I'm also a product of my generation and kind of the, the playlist generation. I like individual songs to have their own character. As an Iowan band that's self-recording and self-produced and self-releasing, you know there's a lot of heart here. You know, it's a very sincere venture because clearly there's no money in it. You can see it's it's getting late here. It's it's a little dark in glorious Minnesota. So I think we're just gonna blues good do. You can too. <laughs> As you can see, it's a new day. It's a new dawn. My camera moved a little bit, so I got some continuity issues, but I'm feeling good. So let's continue with number 15. This one was my most listened to artist on Spotify for 2022. And I think that's mainly because I went on this huge binge at the beginning of the year where I listened to all their 90s stuff again and again and again. And that is Porcupine Tree with Closure Continuation, the most anticipated prog rock album of the year, no questions asked. This was a return after 13 years in the dark from Steven Wilson, really not in the dark because he was releasing some killer solo albums. If you think about the, the frenzy, the fever pitch around this album's release, there was just no way it was gonna exceed expectations. Like at most, it was gonna meet them. And I think with the fan base, with the people who have followed this quartet and now this trio, over the years, this definitely met expectations. I think it's the band in form, doing what they do best, uh, showcasing bits and pieces of sounds from throughout their catalog. But for me, it was never gonna meet the legend of the band. Like my, my mark was too high. They have some albums that are just too high on my kind of all time list to ever meet that. And I would say that Closure Continuation isn't even in the top half of their discography for me. Yet this is some of the best prog out there, no doubt. The songwriting is excellent. The recordings and production is that unmatched Stephen Wilson quality. And the chemistry between these three guys is truly one of a kind. Each member at the absolute pinnacle of their respective instrumental style, whether it be Gavin Harrison's ridiculous groove or uh, Richard Barbieri's atmospheric sound design or Stephen Wilson's everything you know and as much as steven doesn't want to be the prog guy doesn't want to say the word it's like voldemort you know steven this is your bag and number 14 is one that's a lot more reticent a lot more reserved about its musical prowess it's brooklyn singer-songwriter steven becker with a calm that shifts 
an apt title for such a, a soft-spoken bedroom one-man show type of record with uh, kind of that hushed vocal style like Sufjan with, of course, double tracking on the vocals. As a millennial, Becker hits on many familiar points of cultural critique, like these uh, very disingenuous digital identities. But he does so in a, a deeply personal way that makes it very tough to read. These are esoteric, kind of vague, um, very personal lyrics, but just enough intrigue there, just enough to really make me want to decipher and keep looking into things to find new meaning. He does a nice job synchronizing these musical moments with the lyrics, like the song Upstate with the line, dragging your feet in the mud, and it kind of slows down on that part. Lush acoustic guitar is the basis of the sound here, and it really takes uh, a lot of listens to get used to the finesse and the intelligence that's woven into the music here. It really reminds me of the band Grizzly Bear in that way, especially a track like A Disappearing Hand with its dizzying guitar riff and these syncopated moments, the just super dry, crackling, jazzy drum tone and the uh, quiet virtuosity of the classical guitar is just super Grizzly Bear. It's not a record that's gonna get much love this year, but it definitely deserves it. There's a lot of pure prog on my list this year and this one keeps that going. It's my third album from Inside Out Records from this top 20, and it's another debut. This one had a ton of hype, and I think it deserves it. It's a new artist out of Sweden who's formally trained and very well connected in this community. It's a very classic Neil Morse style of melodic progressive rock, and that's Jonas Lindbergh and The Other Side with Miles From Nowhere. There's a ginormous guitar and synth work, there's soaring choruses, there's long and winding songs, the whole bit. One very common criticism of this thing is it doesn't have its own identity, it doesn't take enough risks, it's too derivative of the grandfathers of this genre. You know, and it is a tried and true genre piece that does wear its influences very obviously on its sleeve. So, I don't necessarily disagree, but I love the songs. It's all very agreeable, very optimistic, and instead of, you know, tearing it apart or being too critical or analytical, I'm just embracing it. There's not a single song, not a single musical moment on this thing that misses the mark for me. Every single choice, every uh, instrument chosen, every performance just nails it. Number 12 is another big left turn on what's turning into be a very disjointed list. It's an indie pop duo with hints of country and folk and a little bit of emo thrown in there. It's very similar to the band Howdy with two Vs. It's definitely in that Alex G slacker camp, but with a lot more washed out, uh, dreamier production like JSOM or something. This is a grower because on first listen, the, the dreaminess of it all just kind of washes away with the waves. But wow, the melodies have really stuck with me on this thing from songs like Box Cutter and L Train and um, Soda Can and Climber. These songs have climbed their way to the top of my ranks for the year. They have these cool touches like uh, violin flourishes in there and some uh, layered vocal harmonies and things, but really you could have done just about anything with that chord progression and melody and it would have worked. I actually had to sit at the piano and figure this one out because it was just so weird. Like it starts in D and then you get this instrumental break and it goes up to E and then the last chorus, it goes all the way down to C, so it's really low. It's just like, what? It's very rare for bands of this kind of indie ilk to do that kind of thing, but you can expect that kind of keen musicianship across the whole record. That little bass lick, that right after the chorus, it just, it's moments like that. That's why I listen to music. Overall, this is an album that sounds very, very, very easygoing, very easy listening, a lot like that Stephen Becker record. But like that record, there's some real substance here that just reveals itself more and more over time. Rounding out the first half of my top 20 is a solo album by a member of the band Frost and Arena. Uh, it's another remarkable album from Inside Out Records, and this one's from John Mitchell under the name Lonely Robot, and it's called A Model Life. A Model Life is a midlife assessment of what makes the model life. It's, uh, you know, there's a very sincere longing to it, and that authenticity really drew me in in the first place. Although Mitchell has a, a British wit, he's got, you know, this cheeky kind of demeanor when he's doing interviews, he doesn't carry that into the music. His music is very sentimental, it's very sincere, like I said, and not saccharine. Um, and he's very open with his emotions, especially with 
firsthand life experiences and, and childhood stuff and just, uh, you know, stuff with his parents. Like he gets into on Starlit Stardust, this near death childhood experience where he fell into a river, I think the Thames and floated down and then was rescued by somebody on a raft or a canoe. I think Starlit Stardust is my highlight on the album with its huge dynamic range and interest in God and the divine. You can't deny that epic solo. The song Duty of Care gets into a very familiar topic for John with his troubled relationship with his adopted father who passed away when he was 12 and left John with all these questions and perpetual mysteries you know through his adulthood life and it feels like he's finally releasing that on this song and he contrasts that with his great relationship with his mom and this is done musically as well like the verses are very cold and very menacing and there's something kind of uh, you know eerie about them and then it breaks into this cathartic emotional huge chorus and it's just brilliant that back and forth musically this is progressive rock at its most anthemic and its most melodic there's so many of these earworm choruses but nothing you'd really call catchy like that label is is not right because they're just too grandiose and too massive. There are lots of 80s sounds with the synths and the guitar tones and the uh, you know drum machines and these vocoder effects. But there's a distinctly modern rock sheen to the whole thing that he does so well on the Frost record. So great album, go check this one out. At number 10 is uh, maybe the most metal that this list is gonna get. And it's still very melodic, still very vocal focused and more Swedes on the list. It's the progressive metal band's seventh wonder with their sixth album, the infectious, victorious onslaught that is the Testament. Power metal is a big part of the sound here. It's in the DNA. Uh, not a sound I typically gravitate towards, but this one is just memorable track after memorable track. Chock full of wittily soloing and Tommy Karavik's powerhouse voice. The chops, man, this guy is insane. The song The Light really shows off that range with a key change that sends Tommy into the stratosphere. His voice reminds me a little bit of the guy who sang on the album Altered State by Tesseract with the little runs and riffs all over the place. It's a little boy bandish to be honest, but very powerful and songs like The Light and Carry the Blame and Red River and uh, Invincible, these eke out as much drama and emotion as a band focused so much on virtuosity can possibly muster. And there is virtuosity here. This is like dream theater with a touch of Viking and in sync energy in there. The lyrics and the whole sound is very operatic. It's very melodramatic. It's kind of corny, but that's just part and parcel of this style of music. Like the, the songs and the talent on display here is undeniable and really fun. And I just find myself geeking out over this thing. Number nine is a slice of shoegazy dream pop from Japan. There seems to always be a Japanese group that slips into my top albums of the year, and this one's called Ray, it's capital R-A-Y, and the album's Green. I was hooked from the second track, I Swim at Night, with its treacherous guitar distortion and enchantingly beautiful verse melodies. I have no idea what they're singing about, but I'm really more of a chord change and a melody guy. Like if it's got interesting song structures and chord changes and melody and harmony, then the rest to me is just kind of window dressing. And the number of single competitors on this album is crazy. Like it's 70 minutes long and the hits keep coming and they don't stop coming. The songs Moon Palace and Test really stand out. Test has got this weird guitar intro that leads into these vintage synth drones before the beat just drops in and I'm getting, uh, you know, the Seventh Wonder and this album are just uh, pop perfection, really. I'm basking in it. That tick, 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 tick. It's been stuck in my head all year. And of course there are some weird chromatic chord changes that break from the key center in a really interesting and proggy way. It's proggy, boys and girls. The album is a little bloated. Like it's a little much, 70 minutes long. There are definitely some tracks that could have been left off, but this genre blend of walls of shoegazy guitar and EDM and Japanese idol pop is really unique and there are just boatloads of these magic glistening moments. What would a Matt O'Leary list be like without uh, this next band, the most prolific psych rock band in the world at the moment with just a, a decade 
career run that's unmatched as far as output and quality together. And that is King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard with my favorite of the albums put out this year, it's Changes. I'm not nearly as into the, the jammy stuff on the other albums as I am in this record, which is jazz infused. It's highly considered, it's psychedelic pop. I remember when uh, they announced these albums, these three albums that were coming out in October and there was a vinyl pre-order on the site that went live at a certain time and you gotta be right on it, you can't wait two minutes because all of them will be sold out. Uh, but I saw the three album covers next to each other and I just knew it was like, yep, that's my thing. And at first listen, I really wasn't that impressed. I felt like I heard a lot of rehashing of old material, old sounds. But if I think back on their other albums, that's been the case all the time. You know, I tend to hear those King Gizzardisms immediately. Like that's the first thing you pick out of the big yelps and the four, four sections that are just driving with one chord you know, for a long time and little soloing over the top. And then you got the big Tom fills and you got the falsetto vocals. Those are all just staples of the band that carry across their 20 some albums. But Changes mixes in so many new sounds with jazz mixing with funk and introducing IDM and, uh, you know, electronic sounds in a way that I, I don't think they've ever done before. And some of their best songs from the last few years show up on this thing like AstroTurf for like the 13 minute opener changes. With its characteristically convoluted but ultra catchy theme melody that keeps coming back throughout the album on different instruments. Like on Gandhi, which is probably my favorite track, I love the hypnotic vibe of this one. I love the bass, kind of synth bassy breakdown in the middle. I've said it before, I think no one does it quite like King is at the moment. They're just in this golden period where they can do no wrong for me, I think. Um, you know, they try new things, they throw a lot of stuff at the wall, and it's okay if I just kind of let some of it go, like some of the other material from this year, but there's going to be enough that really sticks that you could look at their career, their, you know, whatever it is at this point, only a decade, and say it's one of the most impressive in pop rock history, you know, since... Uh, the Beatles, I'd say, in that one decade, they've accomplished so much. And from Australia, we just hop on over to New Zealand for this third album from the band The Beths at number seven. It's Expert in a Dying Field. The Beths is a, a smarty pants indie rock outfit led by Liz Stokes's unmistakable voice. And maybe it's just not being used to hearing people sing with that accent. They finally struck it for me on this one. They struck gold with these seemingly straightforward rock, kind of Strokes-esque rock songs that mask their jazz conservatory backgrounds, which are just filling the songs with all these complicated nuances and harmonies. As far as the metaphors of a relationship go, I think the title track is one of the best. I love the idea of being in this long-term relationship with somebody and becoming kind of a subject expert, a domain-specific expert on this person and you know how they work and then seeing it end. It could also apply to being a musician during the pandemic, you know, all of a sudden being devoid of all these live music skills that you've crafted over the years. I can close the door on us, but the room still exists. Such a good lyric. One of, if not my favorite song of the year, this one has tight vocal harmonies. It has these dueling guitars and harmonic bass lines. There's a very frenetic energy about a lot of this album with these sweltering guitar solos like on Silence is Golden or When You Know You Know. But the sunshiny melodies and instantly sticky choruses keep things feeling light and floaty and buoyant. And I like that they don't get too cute with the production. You know, they let the performances they let these inner weaving lines really shine. Overall, this is a very well performed and expertly written little thing. And you know, it, it is in this indie rock genre and I think you know, the goofiness of the presentation and the cover kind of stops it from being this big statement album, but people are taking notice of this band and they're worth it. Silence is golden, is golden, is golden. At number six is a pure jazz fusion entry to the list. It's the renowned studio drummer Simon Phillips with Protocol 5. Protocol has been Simon Phillips' engine for his solo work since the 1980s. I think he put out one album then, and then in the last decade, he's done two, three, four, and now five. And I really don't hear a lot of stuff with this kind of style in the modern era. You know, I know the classics, Return to Forever, Mahavishnu Orchestra, but as far as today, I'm into Snarky Puppy and there isn't a lot more that 
uh, I hear at least that's like this. Fantastic melodies, every single instrument shines from guitars to brass to all sorts of keyboards, all undergirded by this a fearsome rhythm section. I'm very open to other suggestions of stuff like this, but from my experience of listening to a lot of music, I feel like it's rare for something like this to do more than just noodle around. Like it's very technical, but it has feel, it has staying power. One of my most anticipated albums of 2022 lands at the coveted number five spot. And that is the sophomore album from a 26-year-old mega talent. She's uh, toured with Harry Styles, which is weird, but it just gives you a sense of the talent here. Uh, it's the album Revealer from Madison Cunningham. I, I've loved, I've cherished every single second of audio that Madison Cunningham has released to this point. I just instantly connected with this Americana singer-songwriter kind of jazz tinged, but also alt rock styled uh, thing she's got going on. It's just, you know, her voice just instantly gripped me. But most importantly is her songwriting. And I think uh, maybe it's her age, you know, she seems to draw from the same musical well that I did as a kid. And a lot like that Porcupine Tree album, you know, this one, it, it didn't exceed my expectations. It also wasn't a disappointment. It just met a really high mark. The bluesy grit of her guitar and voice on songs like Hospital or Anywhere. Uh, these are just about the rawest moments you're gonna get on this thing. It's very poppy, it's very agreeable, and I can show this artist to just about anyone and fully expect for them to like it. Like, it's just that one that I instantly reach to when I'm searching for something in the car with a group of people that's new. But these are very far from simple songs, even if the overall effect is mild and pleasant. Madison really knows her way around the fretboard and places every note into these tight, no-nonsense pop arrangements. Your Hate Could Power Train and uh, Collider Particles and Sunshine Over the Counter, these are perfect examples of what I mean. You know, they're building tension through these angular guitar riffs and very intricately um, produced percussion parts. You know, it's not just a, a drummer playing, but everything's kind of placed. And then they break into these very sing-along choruses. While cuts like In From Japan show this breadth of influence that extends well beyond the obvious ones like the Beatles and, and Radiohead that are just woven into this. In From Japan sounds a lot like the Rufus Wainwright album Poses, which I love. She really is one of the most talented singer-songwriters out there at the moment. And I'm gonna do my part to just spread her music far and wide. At number four is one of progressive rock's biggest names of the past 20 years, and one that I've failed to get into until this year, which is crazy, but I think maybe their album covers have played a part in this, like, Yes, it is England's Big Big Train with Welcome to the Planet. Greg Spaunton is the spiritual leader here, as I understand it, and he uh, weaves a very classic Genesis sound into their music. You know, that bucolic, folk-infused uh, sort of progressive rock sound is at the heart. The lustrous acoustic guitars on Capitoline Venus or Lanterna are just so bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. They just fill me with all the warm cozies. The album structuring here is impeccable too. You know, at the beginning, you've got all the familiar sounding bangers, like short songs by prog standards. Then the second half is where all these sonic experiments start to come in with more adventurous playing and risk-taking, like the accordion on the epic instrumental A Room With No Ceiling, or the highly technical drum showcase that is Bats in the Belfry. This song has everything from electronica to the sinister brass. The only song surprisingly over seven minutes is Oak and Stone, and that one is definitely a highlight. It's got this just crystalline piano, and um, it's very triumphant, but also moody. The climax at the end with that huge dissonant Mellotron chord and the dramatic vocal, it just, phew. the tempo is so slow, but the drums are just, pounding and it just hits so hard. David Longden's very husky vocal tone really makes this band what it is and of course it's very bittersweet because he passed away this past year. What a send-off though. This album is amazing with the arrangements and writing and the instrumental choices all just 
perfectly done. I feel like I'm listening to true professionals and this is a masterclass. I mentioned the band Grizzly Bear earlier and number three is very closely connected to them. Uh, of course, a very classic indie band from that late aughts period and uh, albums like Yellow House and Vacatomist are right up there with Helplessness Blues and um, Strawberry Jam from Animal Collective and Yes Ayers Odd Blood. These albums were right in the sweet spot of my musical journey, you know, kind of high school time. And I'm so excited to see these experimental pop and indie folk bands continue to do good things. From Grizzly Bear specifically, I've loved their last two albums, Shields and Painted Ruins. So I was so happy to find this next album. It's a venturing off of the guitarist Daniel Rawson with his first solo album, You Belong There. This really isn't too far off from the sonic landscape of Grizzly Bear. You know, you've got this elaborate folk guitar and you've got very chaotic, jazzy drumming. The song Shadow in the Frame perfectly demonstrates this album's lushness juxtaposed with a very frenetic turbulence. The instrumentation feels like it just could go off the rails at any moment, and in that way it has a very live energy about it. It sounds like there's improv, like at any single moment, and tempos are changing, and instruments are sweeping in and out. I mentioned Animal Collective. It reminds me of the album Song Tongs in a lot of ways, especially the songs You Belong There, Keeper and Kin. But Unpeopled Space, that is my song of the year, right up there with Expert in a Dying Field. It's very ornate, you know, it's got this complex arrangement and a very anxious sort of ebb and flow to it that matches the lyrics, which are very esoteric, you know, and they speak of this moment of almost lost hope or just to kind of a catastrophizing. An onion is a bit of an overused metaphor for music, but I can't really think of a better description of this album. It's one where every time I listen, something else unfolds and untangles in my mind. If you like intricate folk music with a progressive edge and melancholic lyrics, then you cannot go wrong with this album. It is a great one. Okay, number two, number two, let's do it. If anyone's still around from years ago, uh, you'll know that one of my favorite bands of the modern era is this next one. Um, I think they're one that defines my musical taste in many ways, uh, and that is the Deer Hunter. There's post-hardcore vocal stylings and uh, symphonic orchestral layers and kind of arena rock sounds and vaudeville from the 1920s. An indie prog band, as I've heard them described, but I think their sound really runs the gamut. It's pretty diverse. And this one proves it. Antimai blew me away. The concept of the album is about as clean and tidy as it gets. It's uh, the whole thing acts as this map to a fictional world that's new, and each song represents a different caste in the society of this world. There are eight rings, as they're called. Um, poverty, industry, low town, middle class, patrol, luxury, nature, and tower. But it's never been the concept that's made me drawn to Casey Crescenzo and this project. It's always been the music 100%. Acts four and five are so good. They're such artistic peaks that I didn't think there was anywhere but down for them to go. And while those two will always stand apart for me and probably be some of my favorite albums of all time, Antimai is very, very special in its own way. He charted this new dance-infused, funkier direction, and it totally worked. It's probably best demonstrated on the lead single to the album, which is Industry, which is such a peppy bop, while Lowtown is a little more similar to his older stuff with this big building bridge and uh, a chorus that's probably my favorite on the record. The last song, Tower, reminds me of Ouroboros from Act Four, and it also reminds me of the Reign of Kindo, kind of that more um, jazzy side of progressive rock. There are some things I, I definitely don't like about this album, like the Hamilton style rap vocals. Ugh. But you know, this album just kept pestering me. It kept knocking on the door since it was released, I think in July. Um, at first I was like, I don't know, is this too much? And then I figured it out and it just hasn't stopped. Antimai really battled it out with the number one album this year. And it turned out this way because I feel like this next band has really outdone themselves with this album after a pretty strong, pretty stellar career. And uh, I, I just feel like they do not get enough coverage in the rock scene as a whole. Um, if there even is a scene, you know, it's it's kind of so scattered nowadays. But 
they really don't get enough attention and this album is just fantastic and since it came out in October it's been a really tight race to the finish and this one won by a nose. This is a band whose pure sound, like the pure ingredients are great to me, but I don't think they've ever made a 10 out of 10 album. Uh, and I think this is probably the first one, you know, it, it's uh, my favorite besides 2015's All A Sock, which introduced me to the band. So it makes sense that that one's a little closer to me. And that is the band Dungen from Sweden. My number one album of 2022 is Dungan's album. And there's just no way I can say it. So I got to read it. And even then it's going to suck. But here we go. In R for Mikket Uktusen Aldrig Nog. I'm sorry. This band was really on the forefront of the neo psych kind of movement about 20 years ago or so. Um, and that's when their most popular album by far in 2004 came out. It's psych rock but it's so much more. Gustav Estes is an incredible songwriter. He plays piano, he plays guitar, he sings, his melodies, his song structures, just everything about his writing is so sophisticated yet poppy. It's just the perfect combination. Then there's the guitarist Raina Fiska, who's kind of one of those obsessive, fastidious type of technicians of their instrument. He clearly just agonizes over getting the perfect guitar tone and his playing is just instantly recognizable to me. It's very atmospheric, but at the same time, very precise. And this album is just magic from beginning to end. It starts with three songs that are more straightforward rockers by Dungan standards, upbeat and cheery with some layered harmonies and some of their signature sounds. Then the experimentation begins with a very jazzy mobler and a, another version of a song that they've recorded a few times. It's called uh, Var Har Du Vart. I think, and uh, most notably it was on Melody's Echo Chamber album, Bon Voyage. There's the French, there's the Swedish, I just can't. And this version of the song is so good. Like they've taken the song that I know and they've redone it in a way that I just never would have expected. It's got this 90s kind of breakbeat thing going on. And then you put that with a gorgeous folk melody. It's such a cool combination. And Fiska's usual guitar wailing in the background. It's a song I knew, but not like this. The record feels like a culmination of their very disciplined music life. You know, Gustav Estes takes his job very seriously. He sits down at the piano in the morning and has a routine. The drums have a, a classic Dungan sound. Like they use this vintage Ludwig kit and it just has such a beautiful tone. There's harpsichord, flute, mellotrons, organs, all sorts of synthetic layers. Not only are the songs expertly written and very dense, very intricate, but the recordings and production are as well. And in that respect, this is their most experimental record and their most exciting record, I think, you know, especially at a time when you just feel like this style of music is dying. They just revitalize. And that's it. That's my top 20 of the year. I'm going to come back and make a couple honorable mentions videos that have just a ton of extra records that on any given day could probably be in this list. So lots of great stuff to check out there. I'll link them below once they're out. And as always, thank you so much for watching. I'm very excited to get back on the horse and start making videos again in 2023. So look forward to it and thank you.